Let's configure CFM between the PE routers across their eVPL service first. I've already displayed the CFM configuration on CSR1, so let's quickly talk about the various global settings. The first two commands globally enable IEEE standard CFM using 802.1ag. Then, I identify some traceroute settings, and we'll explore this feature later. I have arbitrarily decided to use CFM level 4 to represent this end-to-end eVPL -end e service. Assuming we had a large layer 2 network across the core, we would use a lower level across that transport, such as level 2. Because I intend to apply this service to an EFP, we must bind it to an Ethernet virtual circuit or EVC object. More on that later. Within that service, I am enabling the continuity check message or CCM, which is a heartbeat that CFM sends between MEPS. These messages are useful in determining which MEPS are reachable. Next, we define an Ethernet EVC with a matching name as referenced by our CFM service, then identify CFM as the OAM protocol. I know this seems circular because the CFM domain references the EVC, and the EVC references the CFM domain, but this is the correct configuration. Next, let's examine EFP101 corresponding to the eVPL service between CSR1 and CSR6. At the end of the service instance command, I've appended the EVC name. Because the EVC is bound to the CFM domain, this effectively enables CFM on this EFP. Again, I know it's a little confusing. Under the EFP, we can configure CFM parameters such as defining maintenance points. Specifically, we'll configure a map with ID 1 within the CFM hub domain and enable all alarms. The configuration on CSR6 is nearly identical, so let's check to see if the two devices can communicate using CFM. The command shown will reveal all remotely learned maps. On the left side of the output, we see all the key details, such as the domain name, service number, EVC name, and CFM level. We also see number 6, which is the MPID I configured on CSR6. The CCMs were received on an X-Connect from CSR6's loopback using a VCID of 101. This all looks correct. Next, let's ping CSR6 using CFM. Like the MPLS OAM commands, we need to be very detailed supplying the target MPID, domain name, and service number. The ping succeeded and by specifying those details, CFM consulted the MEP database to learn the remote MAC address corresponding with the CSR6 MEP. Let's simulate an error condition because that's a useful CFM behavior. You'll notice that we didn't tell CSR1 that CSR6 uses an MPID of 6. That was dynamically discovered and recorded in the MEP database. There is a feature called cross-checking which allows a CFM speaker to compare its MEP database against a statically configured list of expected MEPs. CSR1 did not identify any static MEPs, which means any dynamically learned entries are considered erroneous. We can enable cross-checking using this exact command, targeting the CFM hub domain and service number 101. The router reports an error condition and enters the AIS or alarm indication signal condition. The error message doesn't tell us much about the problem. We can explicitly ask CFM about any errors it has encountered using the command shown. Put simply, this output identifies MPID6 as an unknown map, which makes sense because we never statically configured this under our CFM domain. In this way, cross-checking can reveal unwanted devices that have joined the CFM network. Let's head to CSR6 to see how it responds to this error. Although nothing is wrong with CSR6 locally, it also reports an error. The log message indicates that a fault occurred elsewhere in the network and uses the code DEF RDI CCM. I've already displayed the error details and we can see the reason is receive RDI, which is short for remote defect indication. This is a flag in the CCM message that allows a CFM speaker to indicate that it has encountered a problem. We don't know much about CSR's problem from CSR6's perspective, 
but we clearly know that the problem came from CSR1 because its MPID is recorded here. That's the power of CFM. When one device has a problem, it screams very loudly, allowing administrators to zero in on the cause. We'll fix this error soon, but first, let's examine CSR6's CFM domain configuration quickly. It's identical to CSR1, except CSR6 has statically identified MPID1 as a known good MEP. Therefore, if we enable cross-checking on CSR6, it should succeed because the list of expected endpoints exactly matches the list of discovered endpoints. Let's try it. This time, the log message indicates a successful cross-check operation because CSR6 received CCMs from all expected maps without receiving any CCMs from unexpected maps. Let's head back to CSR1 to clear that error condition. I quickly disabled cross-checking using the word disable instead of enable, and the device exited the AIS condition. Let's quickly check for errors to ensure the unknown map condition has been cleared. No output is returned, indicating that the error is gone. 